There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless waves. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. We will spread. We will spread the everlasting light with the wind. With the wind. Heart in hand. Heart in hand. Giving God. Send the light, send the light, the, the blessed gospel, gospel light, let it shine, let it shine from shore to shore. From shore to shore. Send the light, send the light, and let it change your beams like the world, like the world forevermore. forevermore. Happy Sabbath, Mission Exchange family. The month of August is Women's Month in South Africa, and I have the distinguished pleasure of introducing our speakers this month. How exciting. Proverbs 31, 29 and 30 says, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. This verse lets us know that a woman's value is not based on if she is married or if she has children. It is not based on if she is rich or has a degree. But if a woman feareth the Lord, she will be praised. The speaker that comes to us today is such a woman. Her own works praises her in the gate. Her name is Elder Kihombo Jiswe Mahobe. She was born and raised in Johannesburg, South Africa. She was the last born of three children. She is a legal practitioner in compliance and privacy law. She is the public affairs and religious liberty leader at the Santon SDA Church. She is also a lay preacher of the gospel. At 35 years of age, she has accomplished oh so much for the Lord. And for those wondering, this beautiful young lady is still single and has no children of her own. Elder, I am excited to hear the message God has given to you to share with us today. Let us pray, family. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here, gathering us together so that we can hear your word from this wonderful woman of God. I ask that you please bless our hearts, prepare our minds, that we may behold wondrous things from your law and internalize it, make it a part of us, that we may look and walk more like you. Thank you again for this awesome blessing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. May God bless you all.
As many countries face the task of helping refugees adapt to new lives, one may ask, what can I do to help? Greg and Amy considered that same question after Greg's grandfather moved from their house in the United States. They wondered how they could put their now available basement to use. As I was praying about what to do with our empty in-law apartment in our house, the thought came to me, we're moving grandpa out into assisted living. This space we could rent and make some money. But at the same time, I heard about needs of refugees who are needing homes. So I contacted our Avenus Community Services leader here in the Chesapeake Conference and I said, do you know of anyone who has been bussed up from the border of Mexico who are homeless and they need a place to stay for a while. He immediately called me and he said, thank you for offering, yes. Their decision came with many questions. Was the family Christian? Did they drink or smoke? Were they honest people? If there were children, would they be well behaved? The information they received was limited. The only thing that we knew was that they were from Venezuela, that it was a family of four, that and we knew their names and we knew the girls' ages. And that was, I think that was all that we knew. That's all we knew. And that they were gonna be homeless if somebody didn't offer them a place to stay. And so we prayed about it, deliberated for a number of hours, actually, as you can imagine. And finally, one of our dear friends, one of our um, close church members, close friends, he always says, do the next right thing. And that popped into my mind and I thought, you know, do the next right thing. What is the next right thing? Well, the next right thing, the next decision that we can make is are we gonna take them or are we not? And so we decided prayerfully, yes, we will extend hospitality to them. People ask us, how could you do this? Um, it's, it's such a big thing. And we have spent 20 years involved in mission work in Asia and I think the way we do this is just, like you said earlier, doing the next right thing, step by step. God stretches you if you are willing to be stretched. Like Greg and Amy, church groups and individuals in different cities around the globe are serving their cities by providing help to refugees in different ways. In Vienna, Austria, a center of influence offers German classes and assists refugees with filling out government forms. The center also has a clothing distribution program and once a week, individuals can come in to have a nourishing meal and pick up food supplies for their families. In the United States, a refugee ministry in Clarkston, Georgia, helps families when they first come into the country by providing them with basic food items. They also provide them with furniture and mattresses. The Adventist Learning Center in Beirut, Lebanon, serves Syrian refugee children. Many of the students have experienced traumatic events and the staff aims to provide them with a stable learning environment. The center interacts with the parents too, by offering literacy and English classes in the evenings. The staff at the Adventist University in Medellin, Colombia, started a special initiative that assists migrant families in starting their own small businesses. Equipment given to the families included ovens, sewing machines, mobile food carts, and printers. The university teachers provided training on how to use the equipment, how to sell the products, and how to manage their business. Fleeing to a new country is a stressful process that involves language barriers, financial challenges, and cultural adjustment. Prayerfully consider how you can help the foreigner in your community. Visit the Mission to the City's website for more ideas. So I encourage you that if you want to make a difference in your community to show God's love, just do the next right thing, right That's Amy? Right. That's right. Step by step and God will help you and guide you and show you what it is.
thinking about and I just saw that it would be a nice opportunity to share my thoughts around it. So this topic really is to explain how Christianity, as much as it is an individual relationship with God, it is very much at the same time a group effort. Okay, so, so you've got your relationship with God but you're also part of a group. And sometimes we make Christianity such an individual experience. And even when we talk about maybe marriage or family, that's how wide the circle goes or in terms of concentrated discussions about um, how to dwell and live with other people. But we don't really talk about how to be a, a proper godly um efficient member of the body of christ okay so as much as you have this individual walk with god you are part of a bigger group that is why the topic is no one left behind you are just not going to heaven on your own okay um you are not in this purpose the great commission for christ on your own you are part of a larger group which is the body of Christ. And we need to remind ourselves about how to properly dwell and be effective, godly members of this group. And to explain this, I am going to use an object lesson of a choir, okay? Uh, I'm part of the Santon Seventh-day Adventist Ladies Choir. Uh, I sing tenor. And, and one of the tools that we use in order for the choir to do well, is that each individual, especially when we perform, you must keep your eyes on the director, okay? The conductor. Uh, we must not look at each other. 
everyone as an individual must keep their eyes on the conductor. And when we do that, not only me as an individual, am I able to make sure that I'm doing what the conductor wants me to do in terms of pace, when to stop, when to start singing again. But, but, but by keeping my eyes on the conductor, I'm able to also keep in pace with my fellow singers. So I'm able to move and sing at the pace as my fellow singers because my eyes are on the conductor. So, so there is this um, tool that we use, not only to make sure that I am in sync with the conductor, but that I'm also in sync with my fellow singers in the choir. Now, with that in mind, in order to sort of further explain the importance of, of understanding and, and taking into account the fact that you must also be as concerned about the group as much as you're concerned about your individual salvation. You must be as concerned about the group salvation as much as your own individual or your family salvation. And you see this um, collective principle of salvation. You see it in the two greatest commandments of loving God, but also loving your neighbor. Okay, you also see this principle, for example, the fact that when Adam ate, the generations after him, we also fell into sin. And, and this is better explained by, by um, a vision that Alan White has. So had, rather. So in early writings, page 39 to 40, okay, to give us better insight on this sort of group effort principle, um, Alan White has a vision to an unfallen world, right? And, and I want to read it, the whole paragraph. It says, the Lord has given me a view of other worlds. Wings were given me. An angel attended me from the city to a place that was bright and glorious. They bore the express image of Jesus and their countenances beamed with holy joy, expressive of the freedom and happiness of the place. I asked one of them why they were so much more lovely than those on the earth. Okay. The reply was, we have lived in strict obedience to the commandments of God and have not fallen by disobedience like those on earth. Then I saw two trees, note this, I saw two trees, one looked much like the tree of life in the city. The fruit of both looked beautiful, but of one they could not eat. What does that remind you of? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? They had power to eat of both, but were forbidden to eat of one. Then my attending angel said to me, none in this place have tasted of the forbidden tree, but if they should eat, they would fall. If one eats, the whole planet falls. So, so imagine a planet, let's say there's 1 billion people, right? Imagine an unfallen planet with 1 billion people or one billion and one. And if one of them eats, the rest of the billion people will fall into sin with that person. The whole planet falls. I call this one of God's righteousness controls. You know, in, in risk management, you've got risks and then you must come up with controls in order to mitigate that risk. And, and you've got this risk of sin. And so in order to sort of have a control for righteousness, to maintain righteousness, God, God has this um, construction of saying, look, guys, if one of you eats, you're not just affecting yourself. 
but everyone else on the planet. So, so it, it makes someone on an unfallen world think that this is not just about me, okay? And so because it's not just about me, the eating, you know, it helps someone not to eat because eh, if I eat, the whole planet falls with me. The same situation that we find ourselves in. You know, I guess because at the time it was just Adam and Eve, they couldn't really sort of grasp the consequences of what they're doing. But there's this thing about understanding that I am not just affected by myself. It's not just me and God. It's me and God and other people. I am part of a group. You know, so, so going back to our object lesson, are we just laying the foundation of why it's important for us not to just have um, be focused on individual sanctification, but also the group's sanctification. So it's not just about me looking at the choir director to sing well. It's also about doing my part for the group to sing well. It's a group effort as well. No one left behind, okay? We're all part of this together, right? So, so today's message is a very kingdom message. Um, it's about unity in the kingdom of God, unity in the body of God to achieve the will of God as a group. Okay, yes, you've got individual assignments, but there are certain assignments that are for the church as a whole. Okay, and and so going back to, to we'll keep going back to our, our choir object lesson. Uh, but unity in the body of Christ is achieved in two ways. Okay, it's achieved, it is achieved firstly by individuals who are focused on Christ as the conductor, as the head of the church, okay? And secondly, individuals who are willing to move along together with fellow believers. But listen to this, by not competing. Okay, so we're going to talk about the spread of competition and how to overcome that because it's one of the ways that Satan uses to bring disruption in the body. So how do we overcome this? The spread of competition, the desire for supremacy. Um, we'll go through it in, I've got four points and then we'll close. Um, one of my favorite portions of scripture is Philippians 2 verse 1 to 5. Okay, but actually the whole of Philippians chapter 2. But the only way to overcome the spread of competition is to esteem your brother better than yourself. Esteem your brother better than yourself. Even if, no matter how much you may think you are better than them, better than them in preaching, you are a better administrator, um, you know, this is the body of Christ. Someone is an eye, someone is a hand, someone is a foot. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, you may really think, and, and maybe in fact, you are a better eye. But even then, scripture says we must esteem our brother better than ourselves. So what does that mean? In Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, and, and I like the heading of this portion of scripture. It says, imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, 
rather in humility value others above yourself not looking to your own interests but each of you to the interests of others in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus now how do we do this how do we esteem and value others above ourselves i've got four points and then we close the first one you must find your value in christ and not in achievements not in positions you must find your value in christ people compete when god is not enough when when there has to be more there's nothing wrong in 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 chasing a goal especially when that goal is in line with the purpose that god has given you but when it gets to a point where you're chasing the goal to undo or outdo the next person especially in the body of christ you know we like i said you always want to be the one who is the head elder and whenever we try to ask you please my man somebody else must be head elder you fight with the church you fight why why are you fighting because you have placed your value in that position as head elder if you lose it you ask yourself who am i who am i and because you don't want to let go of that head head eldership there's this order confusion in the body of christ and so when you find your value in christ when it's time for you to leave a position when it's time for you to make space for somebody else it's okay <laughs> it's okay my importance is not in in what i've achieved the positions that i hold my importance is in christ jesus beautiful statement in our high calling page 143 talking about cultivating self respect it says it's not pleasing to god that you should demerit yourself you should cultivate self respect by living so that you will be approved by your own conscience and before men and angels it is your privilege to go to jesus and be cleansed and to stand before the law without shame or remorse there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit that's romans 8 verse 1 while we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought the word of god does not condemn a proper self respect as sons and daughters of god we should have a conscious dignity of character in which pride and self importance have no part um our high calling page 143 which was then this portion was also taken from the review and herald march 27 um 1888 so it's good to to have self respect because you understand that your worth is in Christ you have nothing to prove okay Christ proved your value when he died for you on the cross. 1 Peter 1 verse 18 to 19 said, "For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ." a lamb without blemish or defect you were not bought with perishable things no <laughs> the blood of jesus okay 
And when you understand that, you are able to, to not hold on or, or try to compete or outdo the, the other person or be boastful um, and cause disorder in the body of Christ. Like I said, you, you people who never want to let go of positions. No, you're valuable and your value is not that you're a head elder. We appreciate the fact that you have done a lot for the church, but when it's time for you to leave that position, it's okay because your value was never that or founded in that. Your value is, in, is founded in Christ. He proved that when he died for me. Secondly, you must treat your neighbor as yourself okay treat your neighbor as yourself as we know this is the second commandment mark 12 verse 30 to 31 it says love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength the second is this love your neighbor as yourself there is no commandment greater than these now Again, there's a beautiful statement in Review and Herald, May 11, 1886, paragraph 2. It talks about how whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even to them. But there's this portion that I love so much that says we are not commanded to do to ourselves what we wish others to do unto us. We are to do unto others what we wish them to do to us under like circumstances. I'm going to read that again. We are not commanded to do to ourselves what we wish others to do unto us. So, so there's this thing where, when people read that, love your neighbor as yourself, they're thinking it's commanding you to love yourself. No. Basically, you must think of, in this situation, how would, I, I, how would I like to be treated? Okay? That's what I should do to the next person. Not let me do that first to myself, and then I'll do that to the next person. No. <laughs> no. It's simple. In a situation where... I am um, going to an event and I'm there with my friend and my friend goes to the bathroom, okay? I then think, look, if I had to go to the bathroom and my friend is going into the auditorium, would I like my friend to keep a seat for me? Yes. So uh, I'm going to keep a seat for her because in the same situation, that is what I would like to be treated. Um, that's how I would like to be treated, rather. You see, so it's not this um, construction that you sometimes hear about how we are first to love ourselves and then um, do that to the next person. So then the question becomes, how do we then learn how to treat the next person? You learn how to treat the next person by being guided by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, okay? So it's two ways, where you're guided by the Word of God, but you're also guided by your empathy for your neighbor. And in that way, you are able to then also overcome the spirit of competition, where if it's, let's go back to this um, example of people who don't want to leave positions at church, okay? In the, in the, if we had to switch roles and you truly, it was clear that it's God's will for someone to take the position that you are currently in, it's very clear. Maybe the Spirit of God has also spoken to you. If we had to switch roles, would you like somebody else 
to hold on to something that is meant for you. No, you wouldn't want that. You see, would you want somebody else to also bully you the way that you're bullying somebody? No. So when we start having this very empathetic approach to people and putting ourselves in their shoes, this, this competing or and especially this desire for supremacy by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit will be overcome. Thirdly, we must allow Jesus to be the head of the church. And I say allow very loosely because Jesus is the head of the church, but you, we really need to recognize Christ's position as the head of the church. This will really stop this competing. Okay? Um, and I, 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 I'm mostly speaking to people who are who love the Lord and who sometimes see things that are wrong in the body, okay? So maybe the person actually, let me put it this way, maybe the person is not really competing, but because they love God so much and maybe among the body there's a bully and because they want to bring back harmony and peace, then they start, you know, going against the bully, fighting with the bully. But now the fact that the bully is there and now you are fighting the bully, that causes even more havoc, <laughs> okay? Causes even more havoc in the body of Christ. Um, you know, I've been, I've seen these type of situations and I'm not saying that there aren't instances where um, the Spirit of God guides us in order to, deal with certain issues within the body of Christ. But there comes a point where we have to allow Jesus to govern and run his church. Jesus must fight the battles of the church. Jesus must be the head, the administrator. And you see this here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 to 22. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 and 22 to 23 right just reminding us how christ is the head of the church he exerted when he raised christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms and god placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church which is his body the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way but now this is where i want to go to hebrews chapter 12 verse 4 um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5, rather, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, okay? Um, we must remember that since Jesus is the head of the church, he will be the boss of the church. He will deal with the issues in the church. You are not the one to try and be the head of the church and try to make things right in the church the church has a head and that is jesus okay and hebrews chapter 12 verse 5 6 7 and 8 says my son do not make light of the lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son and your hardship as discipline God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not the true sons and daughters at all. This portion of scripture basically tells us that God disciplines his children. God is the administrator of his church. And God will fight the battles of the church, whether it is within the body or outside. Okay? So sometimes you need to take a step back and allow the head to deal with the people who are causing issues. Because when you try to deal with them, it causes even more drama. 
okay and like i said i'm not saying god will not sometimes use you um, and guide you on how to address these different issues that come up but sometimes you really need to take a step back and i've seen god come through for his church whether it's for example disciplining the bullies disciplining those who are causing disorder or sometimes he removes them you know he removes them and we see that in scripture um those who are not being obedient to god god removes them sometimes okay um and even sometimes they remove themselves uh so king saul where the prophet even says you and your generation could have basically ruled forever but because you're disobedient you're out god did that okay um and sometimes people end up removing themselves from the body people like judas i'm not saying we should be encouraging people leaving no but i'm saying allow christ to be the administrator the head of the church and remember that you are not the head you are just a body part allow the head to discipline to fight the battles of the church and lastly competing is not just wrong but useless in the kingdom of god okay competing it's useless yeah <laughs> in the world the 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 battle is to be number one okay and that's why there's this supremacy this fighting i want to be first i want to be first i want to be first but in the kingdom of god the pathway is to be a servant okay it's to be a servant so when you compete and are trying to get what you think belongs to you like satan you will be very disappointed and why is that we find in matthew 20 verse 20 to 21 and verse 23 and 26 we find the the mother of zebedee's sons right in verse 20 he says then the mother of zebedee's sons came to jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him what is it you want he asked she said grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom so she's looking for um a high position for her sons again the spread of supremacy wanting uh, the desire for greatness right the jesus said to them you will jesus said to them you will indeed drink from my cup but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant these places belong to those to whom they have been prepared by my father very important principle to note which we'll come back to whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be the first must be your slave just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give life as a ransom for many so christ then says here places these places whether you're going to sit on my right or my left or whatever position these we, these places belong to those to whom they have been prepared for my father okay basically in the kingdom of god god decides who does what who's going to be an eye who's going to be a hand in the body of christ who's going to be a foot who's going to be a teacher, who's going to be a prophet, who's going to be a preacher, what assignment you're going to do, what's your purpose. God is the one who decides. I mean, when we read a scripture about how the Holy Spirit allocates gifts, I mean, <laughs> he tells you. <laughs> he doesn't ask you in terms of which gift do you want. No, he, 
determines and it's up to you to voluntarily accept. But these things are decided by God. You can't earn them. Okay? And so, <laughs> competing for anything in the kingdom of God basically is what is going to disqualify you. All right? And I love what it says here in Deserve Ages, page 549. It says, the one who stands nearest to Christ will be he who on earth has drunk most deeply of the spirit of his self-sacrificing love. Taking into account Matthew 18 verse 4, it says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Okay? <laughs> I mean, when you think about how one of the most important assignments of the church being um, the Israelites leaving Egypt to go to Canaan. Who did God put as the leader or, or the head manager or the head steward of that assignment? Moses. And what does scripture say about Moses? The meekest man on earth. The meekest. Meaning in the kingdom of God, when it comes to the highest positions or the highest honors, it is given to those who don't care about that. <laughs> it's, who don't care about that. All they care about is serving God and serving the next person. They don't care about being, you know, famous and getting glory. All they want is for God to be glorified and to serve their neighbor to the point where they're even willing to sacrifice themselves for their neighbor. Those are who God makes the greatest, gives the highest positions, the highest responsibilities. Those who embody the spirit of Christ. And so competing in the kingdom of God literally is useless. <laughs> it's useless if you're going to compete in order to try and, and gain positions or, or achievements or anything like that. No, you must just serve God, serve other people, be faithful in what God has given you and leave it at that and leave the reward and the positions and all of that to God. So, in closing, today's topic is no one left behind. No one left behind. As much as Christianity is about your individual relationship with God, it's also about how you are part of the body of Christ and are to effectively and in a godly manner work with the other members. Of the body because there are certain assignments that cannot be fulfilled by individuals it needs the whole group and as we are approaching you know the end of time we know like the former rain in order for the latter rain to fall in order for us to do the loud cry the loud cry will be done by the group and that is why as individuals, we really need to appreciate how I am also accountable to the body of Christ. Okay? I'm also accountable. And if the former rain fell on the disciples after they had repented and they had sorted out the differences among themselves, this desire for greatness. After they had sorted it out, the Holy Spirit came, Pentecost. We should have that in mind to know that the latter rain will also fall when we among ourselves stop fighting, stop competing with each other, 
knowing that the loud cry can only be done effectively and well when we are working along in unity to share the gospel. And not just waiting for that for the time for the loud cry, but even now, you've got church buildings. You have a part to play in the church building. The rest of the church needs you to also play your part. Also goes with serving, taking positions. You just taking a step back, thinking it's just about me and going to heaven and my family, being successful. Not understanding that the body of Christ also needs you to be faithful to God and to serve, to do your part, to be a deacon, to be a clerk. And when you don't do it, the body of Christ suffers or doesn't move forward as fast as it could have, doesn't do the work as fast as it could have. Because there's one body part that is just relaxed, just thinking about their own salvation. That's it. And so Councils for the Church, page 240 says, God has a church upon the earth who are his chosen people, who keep his commandments. He is leading, not stray offshoots, not one here and one there, but a people. Not one here, not one there, but a people, a group. And then we read in Revelation 7, verse 9 and verse 10. It says, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. All nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and crowd and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Great multitude. A great multitude. A, not just about me making it to heaven or me fulfilling my purpose for God here on earth. It's about me and you and us making it to heaven. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's about us doing the Great Commission together. All right. It's about the group, man. And so that is how also God uses the gospel to bring communities and people closer together and mend relationships. It's about no one being left behind. We are in this together. Amen? Amen. With that said, may the good Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you.